Hi, Alin. Salamat, salamat. Ito ko wala. Ryan? Hello, uh, sorry, could GovBench send speaker positions in the chat? We also need it for the stream. Thank no you. Problem. Typing it right now as fast as I can. Sorry, I think someone's unmuted. I think it might be a judge. of Science and Diversity 2021. My name is Vance and I will be chairing for this round. Judging with me are Miko and DJ. You guys can introduce yourselves as well. So, yeah. Hello guys, I'm DJ Ugalino from UP. I'll be my preferred gender pronoun is and him. Good luck for the round. Hello everyone, my name is Miko Bombeo from Adjcore. My pronouns are they, them, um, but you should refer to the panel as a whole. Congratulations to everyone who made it this far and good luck. Okay, so good luck, guys. And without any further ado, the motion reads This House would ban stop and frisk. Calling on the Honorable Prime Minister. Hi, can I be heard? Yes, you can. Okay, I'll take POIs and shut. And I have no pronoun preference. Um, I was offered money and also brownies for this. So I'd like to shout out uh, my ex who is watching this round. All right. Uh, she also offered me to pay money to shout her out, so. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. Stop and frisk was not successful in New York, and it was not successful in D.C. When crime rates as a whole stayed level, and in neighborhoods where stop and frisk was prominent, crimes increased. It causes fear, it causes unsafety, and it causes alienation from the state. Three things in the speech. First, the alternative. Secondly, the problems with stop and frisk. And thirdly, what happens when it was used in the optimal best context, which is already engaged in quite a lot with talk. 
First, the alternative. If you want to investigate, arrest, or search people or detain them, you have to have a warrant and you have to go through legal processes to obtain permission from higher ups. If you need to question people, you do it from a distance, you do it non-confrontationally, and they still have a right to refuse unless they have their attorney with them. Why is this the likely alternative? The first is that before stop and frisk, this was the norm. But secondly, this is convention. That is, this is the default application of rights afforded to citizens when policemen conduct investigations. What you have to understand is that stop and frisk is a temporary lifting of the basic protections for privacy and safety of civilians in the name of instilling fear into criminals and minority communities. CJ, it's not yet one minute, you get minus one speak. So what is this debate about? The problems with stop and frisk are several fold, but the first is that politicians and sorry policemen rather have an incentive to use this badly they have an incentive to pad their stats and look good when they arrest more people when they're seen as hard-working individuals from their higher ups police departments themselves also have an incentive to encourage stop and frisk in order to meet their quotas and receive more funding based on arrests why and where does this happen stop and frisk happens most often in ghettoized communities and vulnerable areas which is why 80 percent of people who are stopped on the street are black and the reason for this is racism racism and stereotyping that is to say suspicions of who is committing a crime are more often when they are black and are less subject to internal scrutiny what is the harm when it is disproportionately black in almost every single instance the first is that a lot of innocent people end up arrested for no good reason or go through a traumatic experience of being stopped and frisked and no it is very difficult to act up against a politician stopping you since when they can arrest you for disobeying an officer of the law, you have to comply with what they say no matter what. And there are three harms to this. The first is that the harm itself of the arrest is quite grave in the short term. You miss work, you might get tired and you might get fired. You can't take care of your kids and as such your life gets substantially worse. But secondly, is that the arrest of innocence is not a temporary thing. This shows up on your records and people hear about this. This affects your relationship with people and your ability to put food on the table because you might just get fired. But also this has long-term effects on the community about fear, which I'll explain later in detail later. But secondly, is also in this argument, stopping and frisking also itself worsens abuse. There's a gigantic gray area where there are so many cases of policemen who use stopping and frisking as an excuse to physically hurt you, to sexually harass women. It is difficult to act up in these situations since victims freeze, but also because you don't want to seem like you're suspicious since you want you since you can get arrested if you do look too suspicious. But moreover, the leeway this provides an officer also gives them the opportunity to plant evidence. The physical act of searching lets them plant evidence on your body since they have an incentive to fabricate a criminal. We, this, we know this to be quite a pandemic in the Philippines and we don't think stopping and frisking is helping it. But beyond that though, up might say they want to reform stop and frisk. The first thing is we identify this is not possible. All the reforms and ability to get justice are dependent on having warrants being processed and a court process happening. The problem is that the jurisdiction is given to a large gray area to policemen on the ground, which is why that oversight is removed and as such it's difficult to find grounds for revision and reform. But secondly is that the federal of stop and frisk makes it impossible to raise complaints against the police because they might get arrested on suspicious grounds. But thirdly and lastly is that beyond that, they have to fight back against all the costs of retraining and beating down police units as they make marginal changes in the actual policy of stop and frisk. They don't have fiat because, again, the removal of stop and frisk doesn't cost anything and it's cheaper than continuing stop and frisk. I'll take the clarification now. Uh, so you're a black individual trying to get into a bar and the alarm goes off and this metal what do the bouncers do to you um the first thing they do is they probably tell you to wait for the police the second thing is if there's no clear evidence of abuse they let you go right anyway our alternative does not have the harms of abuse. The first is that there are legal protections through warrants and processes that protects policemen from people. So they can't just be suspicious and then get arrested. You need authorization and a paper trail. Notably, if you are authorized to arrest this person, then you can do that because it goes through legal processes and it does have a paper trail. But secondly, is that the physical separation itself is integral to reducing fear and making life better for individuals. Okay. Third argument, let's say OP uses this well, which is just brushing away some of the worst harms in this debate. Let's pretending it's not happening, pretending the sexual abuse and the, you know, the, the planting of, of drugs and so on on people doesn't happen. What else happens? The first is that this causes a lot of fear, both accidentally because of the fear of being arrested, but also because policemen themselves have an incentive to create fear in order to do this and have a more effective policy. So people end up not wanting to go around, they end up being stopped and frisked and they end up hiding from police officers. There are three important impacts. The first is that the problem with this is that people go less to communities where they may be stopped and frisk, so particularly ghettos, which has severe impacts on commerce and investment in already poor and underpatronized communities since people feel uncomfortable in these areas. But secondly, is that there's less information since people are less willing to cooperate overall, so they're less willing to be in situations where they would be noticed by police, which means that they're less willing to witness crimes, which means that we actually have less information to arrest people in the first place, which means that there would be less people at the, at the, crime, at the scene of the crime in the case that somebody was ended up, uh, somebody did end up triggering an alarm, for example, when entering a shop. But thirdly, people avoid circumstances where there could be suspicion that could be important for economic upliftment, like working at night, for
for example, or many instances where victims of police brutality were victimized because they were out at the wrong time and looked suspicious. So what is the importance of this? The first is that the economic opportunity is important and poor people bear the cost of happening to live in a neighborhood where criminals are. But secondly is that this makes crime happen more often as people become more desperate, get pushed into more crime because they are more economically desperate. But thirdly, the fear itself also increases rates of police brutality since people act more rashly when they end up getting stopped and frisked and they end up doing bad decisions that end up getting them shot because a policeman feared for their life once you act rashly. At the end of his second argument, we simply prove even in the best possible instances of it, and they make it harder to stop crime and they make it harder to make things happen well. Notably, here are some preemptions because we suspect they will first argue that this is good for stopping crime. The first is that we want to note deterrence is not effective in stopping things from happening. The problem is that this doesn't happen often, but crime is not an active decision. Deterrence doesn't work. Since firstly, for communities where stop and frisk happens the most, people do crime out of necessity and circumstance. So even if they are scared of the policeman, they're more scared of not being able to feed their family or criminals who hold them in debt. So at best, the policy is ineffective and a bad use of resources for people who are already scared but cannot stop doing what they are doing. But secondly, that since people are scared of the police, they have their own bad experiences of getting stopped and frisked. You don't get meaningful information just by knowing someone has a gun since it tells you very little about that person. But also because even if you do arrest this one person and that person will eventually get replaced by someone else who is desperate, someone else will run drugs and man street corners with guns. What we do by gaining trust of the populace is we get closer to taking down the system and stopping crime for good by making it difficult for you to distribute crime in the first place and for you to even distribute guns to people. But notably, on gov, on op, rather, you worsen crime. People feel like the police aren't looking out for them. They feel alienated and move to crime since drug lords will protect them and the syndicate will have their back, while the policemen are an active and constant guiding hand on the individual. At the end of this speech, we do three very basic things. The first is we establish crime gets way worse on op. The second thing is that stop and frisk itself is a miscarriage of justice and a fundamental misuse of the state's monopoly of violence. And thirdly is that, um, for all these reasons, it's clear. It's an half-ballot. Thank you for that speech, Prime Minister. Uh, to present the case of the opposition, calling on the leader of the opposition. Uh, audio working. Video. Your Discord notes are loud. Okay, sorry. Killing Windows. Okay, there we go. So I think the first thing to establish is that banning, stopping, and frisking takes a lot of political capital. Like there is very little appetite to do this in a world where there are standard ground laws that allow people, for example carry guns out of fear of crime when there are a lot of republicans in senate and congress when there are a the looming threat of global terrorism that many people are afraid of regardless of where you live that people feel endangered when like riots and protests break out we think those kinds of things show that this requires a significant amount of political will and political capital to do and what that means is that we have access to that same amount of political capital, which we can do to do a lot more helpful things. The first is to make sure that there are, that there are things that hit closer to the root cause of distrust in the police force, right? So we're capable of using that, discharging that will instead to have more diverse police forces that include women, that include people from minority communities and have them patrol and do the stopping and frisking themselves. So a lot of the distrust Disappears when this is someone who looks like you and likely understands your cultural fears of stopping and frisking. It can establish that kind of trust. The second thing it can do is it can also be used to establish things like accountability measures, like body cameras, like more um, tip off lines for potential abusers, like post processing of decisions that allow for police to be, for example, fined or suspended whenever they overreach in terms of their powers to stop and frisk. These are all much more reasonable methods that don't come with the added cost of preventing the police from doing their job. And what I would say about these methods as well is that they're much more likely to fix this kind of rift between the police and the community. I don't think that this distrust comes only from stop and frisk, but from broader concerns of what policemen look like and what kinds of behaviors they do. So I really think Gov is overpromising when they say that just because we ban stop and frisk, policemen are going to trust us again. And they have to prove why that's actually the extent of their argument. There are also a lot of structural reasons to be well implemented. That obviously, one, everywhere outside the U.S., things like qualified immunity don't exist. 
So when it's actually quite a lot, you see it as two things like police officers. And the media is a lot more scrutinized from them. But even in places like the US, like this isn't the 90s anymore. The police know they're being scrutinized. They know their reputation is in danger. And they're li- they're quite likely to create structural reasons to not use this power with dignity, to use it in instances where they will not get cancelled, only when they're relatively certain this person is an actual danger. That's why we think police are rightfully discharging their obligation to protect the public citizens. We acknowledge that it's an invasion of privacy, but insofar as we engage in a lot of survey that we engage in a lot of wiretapping, we engage in a lot of things that are otherwise invasions of privacy to protect our national security and to lower crime. This is probably something that people can send to anyway. The next thing they say then, and this is moving on to the clash of public safety, is that, well, we can probably do it by getting warrants anyway, right? And I think, like, CJ rightfully points out in a few eyes how absurd this kind of process looks like, that you're either, A, going to have to allow someone who potentially is going to shoot up the nightclub into the bar, and even if we concede this is only one out of 100 instances, it only takes that one instance to ruin perception of minorities forever, or B, and this is a more likely outcome, that they're just going to refuse admittance to these people, and they're going to use the plausible deniability of they look dangerous, we weren't sure if they were dangerous, and use that to avoid the accusations of being racist because you didn't have things like policemen to say, well, we stopped and frisked them, and they're clean. So we think those kinds of things are much more likely to happen on their side of the house. Aside from the obvious benefits of um, being able to deter and prevent things like crime. Next thing they say is that, well, um, well, you can get warrants anyway. I really don't think, like, maybe this works in, like, um, you know, city areas with no crime or minimal crime. But in places like Guadalajara, in places like the ghettos, where there are oftentimes things like drug syndicates or things like organized crime that operates in these areas, Obviously, that level of bureaucracy and the graph is not going to cut it in terms of preventing people from actually doing these horrible things. Constructively, then, what are we able to do on our side of the house? The first thing we would note is that given our, our counter model, this also acts as a protective mechanism for minorities, that a more diverse police force is likely to check things like um, white people, things like potential white supremacist groups, the kinds of people who bomb mosques or set fire to synagogues in Europe, and that is an important protective blank for these people, especially in Europe when the whole police racism thing is less of an issue than the US. And we would say you're depriving minority groups of the important protective mechanism, especially if these crimes happen impromptu and in the heat of the moment. But secondly, we would say even in the worst case, where to some extent minorities are police, like, let's not be patronizing here and say that the poor are incapable of doing immoral actions, that even if these are crimes of desperation, even if these are crimes of necessity, the state still has an obligation to discharge itself and say that we must prevent these crimes from happening, we would say in a world where there are things like criminal syndicates, it just becomes a necessary protective measure. They say, oh, it doesn't, you know, people don't carry guns or drugs anyway. But that's precisely because of things like stop and frisk. It's precisely because we've set up that deterrent. We've set up that, you know, the fact that there is a large risk you will get arrested. And it's precisely to the extent that it operates on fear what makes visible things like the worst of criminals to know that they're not going to get caught and operate with a lot more impunity. At the point where that makes life more dangerous and makes people feel less safe. And also ways in stereotypes of racism, by the way, when these things are covered by the media. We're probably winning on that clash. It's almost six, I'll take a POI of this one. Yes, I want to highlight, we already preempted most of this stuff, and we explained, realistically speaking, stopping one shooter is not going to take down the entire system, as we explained to be that, to be more important. Yes, but not stopping one shooter causes the media, causes people to go into a frenzy, to buy guns, to hate minorities more. That's what Gov isn't engaging with. We understand that these are black swan events, but insofar as that happens at least once, it's much, much worse for the same people you want to protect. Secondly, I want to really quickly talk about the performance of public safety regardless of its effectiveness. We would say that in a world where you do not stop and frisk, we do not have the police performing this idea of protecting the community. You're actually likely to get a lot more racist people because in a world where they know the police is not looking out for them, that's when they're more likely to buy guns. That's when they're more likely to open carry. That's when more people who are concerned about the ickiness of like, you know, owning a gun are more likely to be distrusting of communities and arming themselves. So I would say you get much more microaggression and even to the extent of uh, white supremacist groups, actual aggression these people when the police is no longer willing to take the cover for that kind of damage 
The police may be bad, but they are a relatively calming shield compared to the much worse anger and violence of the mob. Oh. Thank you for that speech, uh, Leader of the Opposition, calling on the Deputy Prime Minister. Hello, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. All right, wonderful. Hold on. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna start my POS in the chat. Uh, also, please don't flag your POI, it's just a POI. Thank you. Uh, I'll start my speech in 3, 2, 1. Firstly, the alternatives they name are not mutually exclusive, and I will say they are even harder to get than banning, stopping, and frisking. Firstly, because the alternatives they name are fundamentally opposed to the existing police structure, i.e. diversity quotas often scare the police because they fear they will lose their jobs, i.e. they are afraid they are more likely to get caught. And I'm not saying that we oppose these things as well, but they cannot say this, so this is significantly easier than stop and frisk, because in fact, it takes far more political will. The only claim that they have is that Republicans in Congress that is not mutually exclusive because Republicans oppose these same things as well. Secondly, even policemen don't like stop and frisk because it directly puts them in the line of danger and action because they are afraid that people might act up against them when they stop and frisk them and therefore it's not likely that they get the same degree of backlash that they talk about as well. But lastly, even if you get these changes, it's so difficult to regulate stop and frisk because you don't need an authority because it's a he said, she said kind of thing because once you act once you're able to arrest them, once you're able to stop and frisk them, the only people that are witnesses are you and the person you are trying to catch. And therefore, a lot of cases of abuse, number one, just having more black people in the police like department does not make the police system more racist, less racist. In fact, I would note that a lot of black individuals have made it out of that kind of identity and have raised, rose into the ranks like while in the police, just as a result of them showing that they're willing to betray people of their own race, and they are unbiased and therefore willing to do their job effectively. These don't solve the problem. But moreover, I just like to note that because of how difficult it is to regulate, none of the changes they name changes any of the abuse David points out. Secondly, the POI from CJ that what if there's a black guy and then the alarm goes off, what do you do? Number one, this is the most Ben Shapiro thing I have heard. Firstly, Trayvon Martin was reaching into his pocket for a bag of Skittles and George Zimmerman said that he is reaching for a contraband. It is often the suspicion that makes it incredibly dangerous. Note to its concession, this might be one out of a hundred times. Why are you willing to concede that? There are 99 innocent black people who are arrested with no due cause out of mere suspicion that they are holding a contraband and therefore means it is far less likely that this abuse is likely to be countered. But secondly, I'd like to note this is suspicion. So note that if you can confirm the evidence, i.e. if I'm actually holding a gun to someone's head, the police won't just back out and say, no, 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 I need a warrant. It is suspicion that changes in this debate, not the active confirmation of the deed. So, if they are unable to search your pockets, if they just feel like you're doing a crime, those are the people on off that they can arrest. But if I'm actually about to kill someone, this is like, ridiculous, there's no way a gov team can defend that, obviously police can act in that instance. But let's take that best case. What happens when you have a man with a gun? that is about to be stopped and frisked, that is a man with nothing to lose, i.e. if he knows that he cannot get away with it, if he knows that there is no other way out and that there is no court process to protect them, this is a man who is willing to shoot. So, I would note that it's far more dangerous for the set of individuals that they talk about because if you are certainly going to be caught by the police, if you just back down and do nothing, you are more likely to attack the policeman. You are more likely to shoot businesses and then run out. And what that proves is that Number one, there are a lot of innocent people who are potentially carrying firearms for their own protection or because they exist in these same kinds of communities that Suga talks about, ghettoized, incredibly violent, there is the existence of organized crime, they have natural incentives to want to carry weapons. But they were not previously dangerous because the only reason they carry those weapons is because they thought that someone might act up against them. The moment in which you force them into a decision, you're either going to jail or you will shoot and run and try your very best, is far more likely to become violent on the opposite of the house. So for these reasons, in this 
incredibly conservative and convenient case. I just don't think they can win this debate. Lastly, I will be incredibly generous. I will assume these are good meaning police, that they do this very well. How does organized crime respond to stop and frisk? And if I am able to prove this, all of their benefits on being able to reduce crime within communities do not accrue. Before I move on, I'll take a POI from CJ. Uh, exactly. When Trayvon Martin reached into his pocket for Skittles, because of the mass hysteria and not knowing what was going to happen next, the police shot him. What happens if people are genuinely scared because the police don't know and can't validate anything? Won't that result in more hysteria? No, no, no. The first thing I want to point out is that it was illegal for them to have done this in the first place. But you legalize this through stop and frisk by being able to ensure that you could have arrested so many more of these individuals to begin with. I would say it's easier to crack down on active and blatant police brutality versus the ability for you to, on the basis of suspicion, simply act and arrest individuals. I would like to note that this is the comparative, not one where they get this confirmation on their side of the house, because this confirmation is often suspicion that it leads to immediate arrests as opposed to being able to genuinely try these individuals for the better and i'd also like to note the lack of response to david's claims on being able to have the reduced fear within communities that would increase the amount of crime that happens still stands in this debate and therefore that harms still accrues how does organized crime respond to stop and frisk what they do is they plant drugs in the pockets of individuals so that they can potentially be stopped and frisked what they do is they threaten people to walk past police with contrabands in their pockets or else they will be the ones to shoot them themselves. And the reason for this is number one, you want to be able to trick the police, i.e. a lot of the information that you get on off side of the motion is incredibly terrible and often useless because these are people who have been specifically planted, these are fall guys, that they are used to be able to ensure that the police have no idea how to connect the dots, who is actually in the game and who is not. But secondly, it's terrible because a lot of these individuals are innocent people. And therefore, just as a result of being randomly stopped and frisked, as a result of being one of the random fall guys that people or people with an organized crime look to, it is they then become victims of things like police abuse or they become potentially arrested on offside of the motion. What that proves is that either you significantly lock up a lot of innocent individuals, because again, without this trial process, you wouldn't have known it was a plan. Without the trial process and the ability to grant a warrant, you have no context about the suspicion that you have. You just know that they potentially have a gun. But secondly, it's also just bad because you don't take down organized crime on their side of the house, which you need to get the LO benefit. Because a lot of the information you're able to gather is not good information. And that also responds to CJ's POI, because that means then a lot of the suspicion that you have are targeted at the wrong people because this is incredibly smart and strategic for organized crime to be able to do. For these reasons, they have to contend with a few things. Firstly, why is it for every criminal you lock up on opposition, you're willing to put to jail 200 innocent men and women, or at least put them through a significant amount of trauma as a result of the stop and frisk that they did. But secondly, they do not structurally solve organized crime. They just say that the police are able to act, but do not explain why the necessary action they take are effective or solvent in any manner. For these reasons, we take the debate. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, for that speech. Calling on the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Hi, hopefully I'm clear and audible. I'll take the OIs in the chat, please. Uh, hi, Lynn. Great, thanks. Hi, Lynn. The sneaky part of Gov is they assume that if it is legal that you have court processes, automatically minorities are not going to be shut on, and that's what DPM ignores. A, if it is the case that in status quo, stopping and frisking on the basis of racism is illegal, it's unclear to me why all the prongs of the mechanism coming from PM are likely to not be used for racist views. That is, I think it's incredibly likely that a lot of these racist police officers, if they say that it's so hard to change, are likely to just drop it completely and just kill the same person or arrest them completely because on either side, they possibly have no regard for any capacity to regulate. But secondly, I think it's probably worse on their side because you don't have any differing mechanism. That is, if this person is actually innocent, it's either you quickly produce a new warrant to actually actively put them in jail without having to check up on them, or B, you defer to stereotypes that are not going to be changed, particularly because you still view a Black person to be someone who is a criminal, even if that is not the 
kiss, you are still likely to enact this terribly. We think the comparative is when A, there is greater push to reform this, which I'll explain in way, and B, when you do not ban this, that is more people becoming paranoid. We think it's better. Three parts of the speech, firstly on the model, secondly on racism, and lastly on suspicion. Firstly, why can we reform the police system and why is it exclusive? PM gives two preemptions and then one point of weighing. I'll take down all three. The first claim that they provide is there's too little oversight. Notably, I want to point out that this isn't bad. You're less likely to react quickly on Gov's side because you have to wait for too long before you secure any ability to act on any threat. That provides the impacts. The first is you're unable to ensure that people actively feel safe. It's either that security is denied or security is rejected or delayed. We think oftentimes that what pushes a lot of minority, uh, sorry, a lot of majority groups into the brink of paranoia and wanting to actively hurt other minority groups because they defer to things that are terrible. But all of a sudden, this means that minority groups are unable to feel secure, particularly because the few people who do support them, that is, the police systems outside of the racist United States, because guys, stop and first exist in other countries, I think obviously means that they're unable to be protected. Before I move on to the third impact F. You're just overpromising so much. Like, this is clearly not a problem in most countries around the world. You're just saying people will pick up guns because they're afraid that the policemen aren't abusing minorities. Yeah, it's not a problem in the majority of the world because the majority of the world has stop and frisk. Um, I think as well, this buys into your characterization because if you say that the whole system is pretty racist, then duh. Uh, the third impact is to point out that it is, if it is a case that there is too little oversight, um, we think in the majority of cases, you do change the people who are making those decisions. Their claim is, ah, but even if you're Black, you're still likely to internalize racism. Um, obviously, I think it changes compared to marginally still having white people. Like, while I can assume that you can still reform the system as well on their side, I think it's easier when you do not have to push back on, A, having a ban as well as being able to impose other things like uh, as well as being able to retrain other people. So I think in terms of oversight, we take that. The second thing they provide is, ah, but you lose information because everyone is scared. They don't substantiate this. I'll assume it's because you have distrust. We fix that distrust when A, we change the people who make judgment calls. I'll say it in the last minute of my, uh, of what I just said. But also, secondly, even if it's not less racist, which is stated from DPM, I'd say people who experience these things have family members who go through these things, view their skin, skin color to be the one that is actively stereotyped, as well as go through a lot of these shitty experiences within the actual system, or like likely to be better or likely are likely to be trusted even if they're not better like most of the time people within the community like just based on numbers are probably more likely to give that information therefore i don't think that stands the third thing they provide and there's something that also comes in at dpm's the idea that you need a lot of political will and that's why it's inexclusive um two things uh no there is already existing scrutiny from centrists and liberals on the cjs when you work within the system that is when you do not ban this so we get political pressure on our side to reform uniquely because they do want to support the counter model this is in comparison to god's world where banning it completely alienates more groups and exhaust political will. So you exhaust it because you want to reform the police as well, meaning that you're unable to get the benefit of retraining you have to pick and choose. But also, secondly, I don't think police systems are going to not support it just because they're tired of it. Like, obviously, they're tired of it, but they feel like they want to do it because there's greater, there's greater security and greater scrutiny. That means it's better. At the end of this point, we flip the third point on distrust. If crime gets worse and people go to syndicates and they feel like the government has left them behind, that's likelier on their side that more people go into crime when the police is caught up in bureaucracy. In fact, um, I point out it's legal to simply arrest individuals in status quo. It's not going to be a meaningful change. So A, it's this house would. We have up fiat. B, we explain why it's likely this can happen. Going against the 637 of PM speech, um, all other comparatives interwoven in the second point. Second, on racism. So I want to quickly just take out the commerce argument from PM. I want to point out this largely uncomparative, particularly because of all the things about safety. Um, I, I do want to point out and deal with the push coming from uh deputy prime minister about how what if this person is actively innocent a if it's suspicion that makes him incredibly dangerous i want to give an intuition bump it is more dangerous when a man with a gun is willing to shoot and has nothing to lose particularly when these are white individuals individuals who are likely to use this against minority groups so i understand that uh in the status quo world where stop and frisk exists the majority of people are stereotyped. We push back on that and therefore mitigate that. But also, secondly, I want to be comparative here. Their world is where more people carry guns, for th not just minority groups, because it's easier to get away with and they're unable to ever be taken to justice. The biggest push we get coming from depth here is that they only carry those weapons because they want to protect themselves. We think on our side, you are likely to understand and empathize with them because of all the three reasons I explained about how you have better lived experiences. But we think it's also actively better, particularly because 
suspicion will exist on either side. We have better mechanisms to fix this. We can still have these same things like court process and regulations that can happen after stop and frisk. Obviously, not everyone who has stopped and frisk is actively arrested. The second point I want to clarify is just in the worst case scenario where racism manifests through stop and frisk, the comparative is worse. There will this where stereotypes proliferate better for two mechanisms. The first is because of sensationalism, and this directly engages with the idea of why is it important to care about that one terrible person. This is because one terrible person who arms themselves will create mass hysteria. This is because of three things. A, you're more paranoid when it takes longer. B, you defer to microaggressions and racial stereotypes. And C, you have a little alternatives of security when it is immediate. Note that they don't give an ass- uh, they don't give a prong in their model for how they're going to be able to fix the point of clarification that CJ raised. What this means is it's very likely for you to stop and frisk to be repealed even if you ban this. But also, secondly, it's very likely that this is unlikely to be followed by a lot of white individuals. But the second thing I want to point out is the mechanism of over-policing. This happens because without stop and frisk, racism doesn't stop because of things like institutional racism be embedded. PM says you'll defer to what st- stop and frisk looked like before that. We'd argue it's likely you'll cross boundaries of law. Like it's in the, uh, So why is this comparative important? Three things. Firstly, the existing scrutiny makes it more likely to happen. Know that the government comparative is not being able to reform it or you are able to reform it but you're not able to do it quickly enough for a lot of minority groups. Meaning that the majority of people who are likely to brandish their weapons and kill individuals is probably more likely to exist, particularly because now they are emboldened. The second thing is that we can have better community policing that makes people feel safer. Note that that is actively better than anything that they provide, particularly because it also protects minority groups. But lastly, we think this also ensures that individuals are able to have better capacities to not be paranoid. We think that's how you create better structures for people who are affected by centrism. I'm very, very fucking proud to be on up. Thank you for that speech, Deputy Leader of the Opposition, calling on the government whip. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Luigi. I prefer gender pronouns are day. If you have any POIs, you can raise it in the chat. I want to chat for all of your POIs. All right. Starting my speech in three, two, one and go. So apparently, I also am proud to be at government. Um, opposition has the most oversimplistic and uncharitable response to our case. They say that policemen will always be racist, so they will keep on shooting black people no matter what, and that they will always have their suspicions, so it's always going to be done through warrants. It's always going to be done through the courts. It's always going to be done through every other institution in the world. There are two things I want to clarify here as to why we flip this argument from even PM speech. Number one, we proved that stop and frisk enables racism significantly. That even if they have their suspicions, it is disabled by many of the other reforms and mechanisms and requirements for due process that we provided to you, which are the only alternatives they can resort to absent, outside of the ability for them to use stop and frisk. Because if they do not know that this person has a weapon, they cannot use the justification that they acted on self-defense. But if they had stop and frisk, and then they thought that this individual did have contraband on them or did have a lethal weapon, then they could use the justification for self-defense. That is the way we flip this argument. Number two, it is much harder for a policeman to kill a random person on the street and think that, oh, the stereotype, whoa, he's so scary, he's going to carry a gun and shoot me anytime. If you do not have stop and frisk, it's much harder for them to justify that if the policeman could literally lose their job or go to jail and they will just randomly kill many of these individuals. So they cannot just say racism exists no matter what. We showed racism is lesser and lesser enabled because of stop and frisk being banned. We flipped that. Three things. Number one, on the effectiveness of stop and frisk. Number two, on the experience and use of stop and frisk. And number three, on the prospect of stop and frisk. Number one, on the effectiveness of stop and frisk on crime. So at Nico's speech, we made it explicitly clear that our argument was that organized crime have incentives to put the poor in the front lines for them to be at least more vulnerable to this process of stop and frisk such that they can delude and take away many law enforcement authorities as much as possible so they can increase the quotas of these law enforcement while also increasing organized crime rates as much as possible, which only disenfranchises the poor. What is DLO's response to this? Their only response was, no, 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 look at Guadalajara, look at the crime is low in all of these places, so it must be because stop and frisk is already allowed in these places. Number one, I guess crime also goes lower as carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere or also as BTS becomes more popular, or number Number two, if they will go to syndicates, it is probably because of stop and frisk and also because of the increasing crime rates and distrust in the police forces because they go to organized crime syndicates because they get order and stability 
that the policemen otherwise could not. This is the argument we gave to you at Nico that was completely unresponded to you. They just assert that crime will continue and that crime goes away because of stop and frisk, but they don't prove us why like a lot of white people getting a lot more guns and shooting a lot more black people is likely to be the counterfactual. When we've proven to you, it becomes harder and harder for you to justify that without the ability for you to have stop and frisk because stop and frisk confirms those stereotypes. It makes it more and more easier for you to try and enable condemning more and more people to be subject to stop and frisk. And that is why racial profiling is a significant problem whenever stop and frisk enables that racism. We flip this argument from the beginning as to why it is ineffective. Number two, on the experience and use of stop and frisk. Again, on a Opposition significantly underestimates the experience of stop and frisk, and the LO does not change this when they talk about body counts, when the reforms that you do, because they don't change what it feels like to be stopped and frisked. This is a severe invasion of your privacy. Even if you are innocent in the moment, like you're just carrying skittles, like you're just a black person walking into a convenience store, you will still feel scared. And your instincts will take over in the moment when you are asked to put your hands up and be subject to stop and frisk. This is the core of the argument that was not responded to by the reforms. They just say, oh, we can hold the media accountable. We can uh, look at diverse communities and put many more, more body cams. I have a few responses to this. Number one, body cams are only utilized, guess what? When you can watch it after the fact. So it still causes the instant anxiety that many of these individuals feel and the lack of agency and control for this individual such that there are more instances of abuse that are more likely for these people. Number two, minorities in these police communities does not change the fact that they are wearing a uniform that is scary to look at, that it causes a point of vulnerability, the ability for you to feel helpless in the moment because they are really putting their hands all over you trying to see and if justify if there is contraband on you if there is some gun on you and the fact of the matter is the fear alone already creates this anxiety and the ability for you to feel that your agency is lost what is DLO's response to this DLO's response is no 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 no. we can violate privacy for the greater good because crime is the most important thing wiretapping is allowed anyways we can subvert due process no matter what so we can stop this one scary shooter I have two things number one news flash wiretapping is also seems to be according like against many of the constitutional rights against most individuals that is why you need to justify most instances of probable cause in the vast majority of instances Miko gave the explicit burden push against opposition that they need to defend why suspicion alone is a justification for many cases confirm those suspicions. But number two, stop and frisk uniquely is different because it operates on significant reliance on the account of the policeman. A body can make show you what it looks like for this individual to be anxious or what it looks like for this individual to be put into arrest, but it doesn't show you what the context was behind this individual and what his experience was. It will substantially be disproportionate towards the favoring of the account of the policeman and that's why most individuals are going to be disenfranchised. Let's go. POI. So is stop and frisk the only reason people fear the police? Because if not, Gov is substantially overpromising what they can actually deliver with this model. Well, we said it's a significant one. Debates operate on significance and it operates on the ability for us to ban certain procedures that are absolutely terrible. So yeah, policemen can try to be as racist as they want in court. But I guess we make it significantly less likely because a court process is easier for you to identify many, many of these documents, many witness testimonies for more and more people to go come forward. But your stop and frisk is preemptive because according to the info side, it operates on the ability of one policeman to call one individual on the street and allow them to arrest this person without authorization of any external authority. And the only account that you can have for this is only after the fact where the abuse is already done. Because of this, the prospect of stop and frisk is absolutely unsubstantial. Um, again, community. Last issue, prospect of stop and frisk. Again, we made it significantly clear that stop and frisk worsens crime and poor poverty in areas that are vulnerable to this. DLO's only response is just to say that this can increase the and that the stop and frisk is a tool to verify doubt. Like, oh, you see a black person and you're going to verify ah, this person's actually a good person because I can stop and frisk the person. I have three responses. Number one, if a policeman acts out of jurisdiction, like interfering, breaking physical barriers, then in our world, it is easier to hold them accountable for the reasons I identified to you earlier. But number two, even if they do have deterrence in their model, they don't change the fact that there is still fear against the police on their model or the underlying reasons for individuals to go to crime because it is also motivated by fear against the police because they'll be more scared of the police on their side as well. But lastly, again, I still confirm to you again and I will repeat this response again they will always confirm these stereotypes because many of these minority communities are also the same ones that will be subject to stop and frisk so they cannot just say oh this person's a good guy naman pala and that's why we can be able to solve crime for these people they cannot do that their counterfactual is absolutely ridiculous and that's why we win 
Thank you for that speech, Government Whip. Calling on the Opposition Whip. Okay, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Cool. Five, four, three, two, one. It took dozens of public murders of innocent black people for the U.S. to start considering abolishing the police or reform. But one attack on democracy, a single event of 9-11, was all it took for us to declare a war on terror that has killed millions and has doomed the world into severe over-policing ever since. Because this world is not the world where you remove stop and frisking and people say, okay, I guess I'm not racist anymore. It's a world dominated by fear and insecurity. And I just want to make sure, I just want to make clear that this is where we win. Because Luigi says stopping and frisking results in more racism. But this is not panel. This is not a world where you prefer having a world where stopping and fisting was not instituted in the first place. This is actively taking it away in a time where people are scared of the state overstepping its boundaries. Scared because people are taking away stand of your ground laws. Scared because people are forcing them to wear masks in America. And if David does not want to talk about places outside the US because there is less propensity, then fine. We'll make it America. What happens to the 60% of individuals who are moderate to moderate, right? When they realize that not only do stand your ground laws not exist anymore, but also that the police cannot even apprehend people they think are criminals with without first bringing them to court or turning them away, that is where we get mass hysteria. Why was that the most important impact in this debate? Why is it so? Because we told you that both sides were mostly symmetric because regardless of whether you're stopped or frisked, if someone is primed to shoot because of hysteria, they were more likely to shoot. And Luigi says that too because he says that if people are scared and then they see you and then they frisk you, they will shoot you. But if the police are calm, if you literally hand over your bag or raise your hands, they search your bag, they find the gun, they won't shoot you. The reason why Breonna Taylor or Trayvon Martin were apprehended was not because they were stopped and frisked, was because the police stopped them, they reached into their pocket, and because the police thought and they were hysteric and they were in a high crime neighborhood, that's when the police shot. What does that mean? It means that even if police don't stop and frisk, if we can prove to you a higher probability of people being hysteric, that still rises, that raises the ability of policemen to do worse things. Two issues in my speech after this. One, can we regulate it? Two, what happens when you ban it? Firstly, can we regulate it? Let's use a golf context. Without a single overwhelming case to flip public perception, aka removing stopping and frisking, there is still going to be intense scrutiny of minorities versus the police and then the majority versus minorities. What does this mean? It means that we can only choose what laws we want to pass. We just barely removed stand your ground in two or three American states and people already started open carrying. This is far worse because now all police can no longer apprehend people and frisk you. And that is going to be likely and that information is likely to make its way into the right wing and make its way into the minds of people who will start being hysterical. We had five responses to David. Let me frame them. The first is David says, oh, but you can't regulate this because you need courts to regulate. This removes your ability to go to court. We told you, A, this already coincides with most police training after BLM and democratic wins. This responds to Mika's argument against police structurals. Uh, structures because they are already being amended. But secondly, again, like I don't think people in the US fear women and police. If women want to request for a woman bodyguard to police them, then they will probably find the police around there. If they don't, then they will get publicly canceled. The second is body cams. They say ah, but, but body cams only occur after the fact. Uh, yeah, the guy who shot, uh, the, 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 guy, the guy who shoots people will get apprehended after the fact. Their families get sent death threats. They are going to be put into public perception. People think about it when they aren't hysteric. The third is everyone has cameras now. There's a lot of FB live streams uploaded. So even if you don't buy the body cams, you buy people actively putting yourself on the face of a lot of people at that point in time. But fourthly, it also coincides with positive incentives to employ women to women or African-Americans to African-Americans. Mika's response to this is to say, ah, but some black people are racist. Yeah, but they feel less attacked when it's a black person patting them down or when they feel less attacked if it's a fellow woman patting them down. So that still resolves their argument. The last thing we told you is that like a lot of policy changes have actually already been occurred. Like a week ago, a woman reported fe feeling violated that she had to take off her bra because she wanted to enter a prison. What happened? They started using a metal detector wand 
in or before they were ever frisking anyone anymore. They got canceled and they changed it. And that was precisely what we wanted. We said stop and frisking was not the first thing we would do. We would put you through a metal detector. We would wave you down with a metal detector one because people don't want altercations and people want to feel safe because policemen don't want to get into a gunfight because they have to go home to their family and they don't want to lose their jobs, which is happening in increasingly racialized America. I'll take a POI from David. Wait, wait, so why can't you use metal detectors? Like, why isn't this enough to make people feel safe? Uh, literally my POI to you, David, listen, if they go through a metal detector, it rings, you can't touch them, what do you do? Either you kick them out of the establishment, which results in the legalization of district and zoning laws against Black Americans, or as you said in your response, which you can't flip again and reply, they would call the police, take you to the precinct, and then search for you after you get your warrant. I want to ask you, David, what do you think is more traumatic? I think it's the latter. I think it's being denied your basic rights from entering a bar because the metal detector goes off and it's just your fucking belt. I think that going to the precinct and then being patted down is far worse and you have not been able to respond to that with three substantive speakers. What else do they say? Uh, DPM says policemen don't like stopping and frisking. Sure, they don't like it right now, but if the comparative is removing all of their rights, stopping and frisking, people react to things being actively taken away from them and therefore they will probably like it less which flips your analysis. The last one they say is, ah, but one murder versus 99 arrested. Like, again, God is just overpromising. That's strange. Like, everyone, even in the Philippines with a very corrupt police system, gets stopped and frisked. Why would they arrest you if your hands are up? Why would they arrest you if they have no reason to? Why would they arrest you if they aren't hysteric? At worst, you get turned away from the establishment because you don't want to be stopped. But fine. Let's say racism exists and you're stopped and frisked. Again, this is a comparative. A world where you have some level of racism, you stop and frisk someone, their hands are up, you find the gun, or a world where you find someone suspicious, you can't do anything against it, they reach into their pocket for skittles, and you think, now is my time, I have to stand up for my rights, people are going to die, you shoot them. The last thing is just like analysis. In our world of stop and frisking, people don't go to a bar with a gun and expect not to get stopped. They expect to be stopped. And that analysis is what stops black people from f pulling their gun out and fighting policemen. Because if you want to commit a crime, you would do it regardless. We agree with Miko. But the wanton violence he portrays of people just randomly getting shot because they want to shoot just doesn't happen because people are prime. What is the last thing that happens? Second issue, like last analysis. What happens when you ban? Again, we say this is going to go on to all major news sites. Mass hysteria. One record of a single black person shooting down a bar because it could have been, pre could have been prevented because the alarm went off. People will completely stop and turn away people. But two, this captivates the moderates and makes them sway as was unresponded to from my LO because fear is a powerful motivator. You are not only going to stop sovereign frisking loss, you are going to reinstitute it. It's going to get worse. People are going to backslide. But lastly, more crime happens. Why is this so? If you buy Mika's analysis on crimes being perpetrated. On our side, if you care, if you walk around with drugs and the police see you, they can't stop you even if the dog sniffs you because they need a thing. That means probably more organized crime. That means more people going around robbing people. That means more people walking around with drug news. I think that on all counts, based on mass hysteria and just logic, opposition takes a debate. Thank you for that speech opposition whip calling on the opposite. Hi, I think I'm clear. So I'll just start in three, two, one. I'll explain why we get to our benefit better because everyone's saying you overpromise. I'll explain why we don't with our counter model or just at least where we don't have a ban because government hasn't been engaged with a counter model. First, if the panel still believes that stop and frisk enables racism, we dealt with this in, I think, probably three ways. The first thing that I get at this, we explained how minorities and communities are probably better alternatives to the existing number of police, better proving this compared to the DPM response about how no, they're still likely to be racist. What this means is, at its shallowest, we win this part of the issue because we explain why we can stop this to more trust, aka we erase the ideas of deterrence, not effective because they don't have trust. But also, secondly, only op exclusively protects minorities at the, I think, five-minute mark and the four-minute mark of the yellow speech, particularly when we explain how we also protect minorities when there is less rates of crime, because minorities oftentimes are the ones who are killed when they are left alone. Second, the problem here coming from Gov is the comparative. How we dealt with this was to give two mechanisms from the LO about sensationalism and over-policing and the context from LO about security and why that matters, aka you can't just revert back. This is in the context of the future where people want to feel secure. So point A, Gov drops a debate because they assume you'll be less racist when this disappears. We won this because we explained why at best racism is symmetric because you will still have stereotypes, aka 
due process is probably not likely to be enough of a deterrence for people who are actually terrible. But secondly, and more likely, at worst, we explain why racism is worse, particularly because it's either you kick them out when it's just a metal detector, or you're actively just going to delay the way that a lot of justice is created, meaning that you're unable to ensure that you protect minority groups. So point B, even if racism doesn't change on our side, and this is the charity that GovWeb was looking for in the DLO speech, what we said was we protect more minorities who become victims. So the way in this against Gov, explaining how minorities probably feel like they need to protect themselves less is probably better for a lot of these minority groups, particularly because while we're not going to solve institutional racism, we do explain how people are safer, how you're able to at least make sure that more people feel like they can trust the police. And lastly, even if they don't trust the police, we think there is less pushback against them because of all the harms of sensationalism. The most persuasive push we got coming from OP and Gov, and this is the last thing I just want to notice, on the idea that people distrust the police. So I just want to point out that court processes are their only mechanism from PM. This is where GovWeb strawmans. He also bit scores processes on suspicion. Notably, I don't think it actively meaningfully changes anything on their side. So at best, even if you distrust the police, uh, we pointed out in LO and in the POI that there are other reasons why you likely distrust the police. So it's likely that you're unable to get any meaningful change in Gov. Sure, what if they get all their benefits? And what if we just still have racism and shit. Uh, I think it's probably better to A, have better forms of security because as pointed out, it's an umbrella thing. It happens to minority groups. If they are threatened, then it probably means uh, if everyone is threatened and everyone is probably going to point fingers at them. Secondly, we win particularly because it's better on our side uh, as opposed to their world where you ban this and people still distrust the police and therefore people turn to eco people turn to active crime syndicates, which is what we flipped in the last part of the PM case. Lastly, we think this is better as well for all the benefits of commerce and shit that come could come out a bit weirdly coming from PM. And that's how we're able to win. Particularly because A, we talk down the DPM case about how you confirm biases. We mitigate this, explain why it's better. Second, we explain why the PM case does not engage with the rest of the debate. That is, we explain why racism is likely to be worse on their side when you revert back to it something they're unable to engage with coming from WIP. But lastly, at WIP, we're able to push the actual context and why deterrence will likely be effective. And if it is not effective, why it will be good for people who are actively terrible. Um, notably, this takes us the debate across all three engages because even in the best scenario where you're able to at least have less racism on their side, you're unable to ensure that you're immediately reacting to how people have. That means you get worse crime. Uh, it's very rare I get to debate against these same three people who taught me how to, uh, but also very rarely I'm 100% sure we won. Thanks. Thank you for that speech opposition reply. Calling on government reply. Hello. Uh, can I be heard? Loud and clear. Cool. All right. Oof. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. This is a false comparative. It is not Gov banning stop and frisk and then up fundamentally fixing all the problems with the police system. That is not the debate. Firstly, what I explain is that there is a disproportionate amount of political will needed to do this. But secondly, and being absolutely generous, we explain that even if you're able to fix some problems with the police structure, it is precisely the lack of checking mechanisms because you can act on suspicion because you don't need an authority. That means that even if the structure outside stop and frisk works, it is uniquely stop and frisk that countervails all the possible regulations that you have and therefore makes them far more unaccountable. So this counter prop is not not only fake, it also doesn't work. Two things to discuss. Number one, the problem on op is they don't explain why the value of preventing crime is more important than protecting the innocent. Firstly, how do you weigh this? Let's just ask what is more likely. They do not deny a lot of David's reasons to explain that policing is far more likely to happen within vulnerable communities, and they are far more likely to target a lot of like uh, black individuals in ghettoized areas. At best, what they say is that there's no reason for you to arrest random people. When David gives structural analysis as to why the number of arrests of a police department often correlate to their effectivity to the public, why the number of arrests that you make as an a, like individual policeman often directly correlates to your ability to get promoted. So there are significant incentives for you to make arrests, and therefore they cannot simply count to that. The problem is they don't explain how you're able to deter organized crime. At best, they say they are now able to act. They don't 
explain why these actions are good. In fact, the lack of response to my extension on organized crime is precisely what flips this section of the debate, i.e., number one, not only does this mean that you target a lot of innocent individuals who are simply plants, who are victims because they know that they should be fed to the dogs as stop and frisk the, the, you know, food, but secondly, that a lot of the information that you need to take out organized crime becomes fake because these are not the actual people you have to target because these are innocent individuals who just happen to have contrabands or are forced to walk around the police in order to protect the people who are actually doing crime. And therefore, they don't really get this benefit of preventing crime. At best, they say if someone's going to shoot up a whole place, they'll stop them. I'd like to note that the moment they have a gun out in their hands and trying to shoot a whole entire area, that is when the police can act. It is suspicion that changes in this debate. Secondly, it don't explain why this is just even principally just. I.e., CG says it's not one out of a hundred people when Sulit says it was one out of a hundred people, so it's a problem with their team, not ours. But secondly, they don't explain again why the collateral damage was fair. And note, this isn't just you losing privacy to an extent. Not only do we explain the incredibly tra traumatic impacts of stop and frisk, we also explain that it affects your employment, it affects social perceptions of you as an individual person, or if you are arrested, you significantly lose out on a lot of like the capacity to gain like employment, the capacity for you to maintain the same standard of life that you have. What that proves is that even if they get their benefit, which I don't think they do, in fact, I think we do, they just don't win the debate in their inability to weigh this benefit. Secondly, on racism. Firstly, it's very lazy for Op to say racism exists on both sides, because I'm not going to disagree with that. The first thing I want to note, however, is we uniquely say this enables racism. They say, well, the court case is also racist. Well, the warrants are also racist. I want to note that if you have specific evidence that this person is not a criminal, you cannot racism and say, ah, this person is still a criminal, even if you have the ability to do that. And I'd like to note, this doesn't have to be a perfect court case, but increasing the amount of due process that exists that could potentially protect more and more innocent people is precisely why even with racist structures, actual facts and evidence that are needed to be able to arrest them and prosecute them are necessary to prevent the racism to exist. But secondly, they say it's good for minority communities to be able to prevent crime. Number one, what I explained in my speech was that if people fear being stopped and frisked, they are more likely to act out in violent manners and therefore shoot witnesses and try and find a way out if they will certainly be arrested because of stop and frisk. Number two, they don't weigh the fact that if they're unable to prevent organized crime structurally, the economic damage to you losing out on your work for the day but also losing out on work for the future because you now have a hit on your record is far more likely to damage these kinds of marginalized communities. I am incredibly proud to propose. Thank you very much for that round. Just give us a few minutes to deliberate. And yeah, good luck on the next rounds, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone.